All right, y'all. <clears throat> so this is part two. Part two, or you could say episode number two of debunking the Trinity, the Trinity, the bunk, whatever you want to call it, part two of this series. And we're just going to get straight into it and give you all, you know, more edification on how the Trinity, which is a part of the false Christian doctrine, is false. All of it is false. And we're going to continue to give you all more precepts on how it's false. And we're going to do all this through Yahweh's work, God's word. Nothing that I'm going to say is going to come out of my own mouth in terms of what I think and my own. No, nothing is opinionated. It's all out of the Bible. I'm reading everything verbatim and explaining it to the to the T. You know what I'm saying? But let's go again to it. Go ahead and share my screen. Like I said, y'all go ahead and get out your notes. <coughs> go, ahead, go ahead and get out your notes class. <coughs> Going to get right into it. Take y'all, get a pen, paper, highlighter, get your Bibles out. Get everything out that you need, you know what I'm saying? To help y'all uh, <coughs> be prepared for, you know, what I'm about to tell y'all. So let's go ahead and get into it. Let's go ahead and get into it. I'm going to start the study music real quick. Get my timer, my 30 minute timer. Starting now. All right. So. As I left off last time, or I didn't leave off on this, but I said I, I wanted to get into this, but uh, I was going to stop at, at before I got to this because of the fact that this, I wanted to really explain this part right here. So look, so 1 John 5 and 7, 1 John 5 and 7, so look, it reads, for there, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So, the thing about this verse is that Trinitarians can use this verse to their to their advantage. If, if the person they're, they're uh, having this conversation with is not educated enough, they can use this verse to their, to their advantage and completely destroy their whole, you know, argument against Trinity. You know what I'm saying? Because it, cl it clearly says right here that the Father is Yahweh, the Word, which, which is uh, Christ, Yahweh Shah, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. So everybody, they can easily use that to their to their uh, advantage, right? But let me show y'all something real quick. Like I said, take notes. Take notes, y'all, because this is very important. Take notes. Something called the Johannine Comet. <clears throat> the Johannine Comet. The Johannine Comet. So look. It reads right here. The Johannine Comet is an interpolated phrase in verses 5, 7 through 8 of the first epistle of John. This is the first epistle of John. First, same, first, first John 5 and 7 through 8. An interpolated uh, phrase. What does interpolated mean? So it reads, interpolated means an interpolation in relation to literature and especially ancient manuscripts is an entry, an entry or passage, passage in a text that was not written by the original author. That is not written by the original author. So it means that 1 John 5 and 7 through 8 it was added into, or it was interpolated in the uh, from the mention any scripts. Because if you go back to you know the mention any scripts, mention the ancient manuscripts. I, I say that backwards. The the ancient manuscripts <laughs> or the ancient texts, you won't find First John five uh, seven through eight in there. You won't you won't find these two verses right here. Why? Because of the fact that they've been added that they've been interpolated or added to it to once again try to prove the point of how the Trinity is real when it's not. This is all used to prove their, their uh, doctrine of the Trinity. 
throw the Johanne comment anytime a Christian may try to bring up First John five seven and eight. Talk about the bring up the Johanne comment. Ask them, do you know what the Johanne comment is? Because look, it says <laughs> it says right here. It became a touch point for the Christian, the Christian te theological debate over the doctrine of the Trinity, from the early church councils to the Catholic and Protestant disputes in the early modern period. And if I'm if I'm not if I'm uh, correct, the Protestants first of all, the Protestants were the ones who took the apocrypha out the Bible. They took the apocrypha out the Bible. They took it out the Bible and wanted to add these verses into it. Just so they can prove their point of a false doctrine of Trinity or Trinitarianism. <coughs> and the Apocrypha got so much important stuff in it, it don't make no sense. But once again, if somebody wants to bring up first John 5 and 7, bring talk, ask them, do they know do they know what the Johannine comma is? The Johannine comma. The Johannine comma. So this right here out the window there's no use for it there's no need to use that verse at all clear as day that verse is, is not even in the, in the ancient uh, manuscripts that's that's how you like going to i guess in a sense being a scholar because of the fact that you got to make sure that you know the word that we read nowadays goes you know by the ancient text because the ancient texts are are the like you know they're the original text that's where you know these translations stem from. That's where you know King James, the King James uh, Bible, stemmed from. It came from it, the King James Bible was wasn't the first Bible, or wasn't the first written text of, of or of you know the Bible and everything. It was translated in <coughs> 16, uh, 1611. So I got to make sure that y'all you know go go back to the ancient manuscripts and use those as as a, a reference to how uh, accurate uh, the word is nowadays. You know what I'm saying? But now let me go to uh, John 14, 28. So John 14, 28. So this, this goes against the whole co-equal argument. Once again, the co-equal argument. How Yahweh Shah and Yahweh or God and Christ, how they're co-equal. They're, they're, uh, they have the same power. So it says right here. Um, and this is Christ's words. First of all, hold up. Put in red letter. These are, these are Christ's words himself. A lot, a lot. So a lot, of, a lot of the things that goes against uh a lot of the things in the Bible that goes against the, the Trinity doctrine, it comes out of Christ's mouth. It comes out of his own mouth. <clears throat> but first John, I mean not first John, it's like that. John 14, 28 reads, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again and come again unto you. If ye love me, Ye will rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. But what? Now look, for my Father is greater than I. His fa the Father Yahweh is greater than Yahweh Shah. Came out of his, he said that out of his own mouth. So once again, well, this this question that you can pose: Is there anybody greater than God? That's the question you you can pose. Is there anybody greater than God? If you ask them, that, if you ask anybody that, they, they may say, no, there is no one greater than God. Then you ask them, okay, is anyone <coughs> greater than Jesus? They may say, no. They may say, oh, look, but Jesus, he is God. But you already got verses to prove how he's not God, showing you how they're very distinct and very different in terms of them not being co-equal and them not being on the same level. They're very distinct. But this verse right here says how Yahweh Shah came out of his own mouth and said that the Father is greater than is greater than him. So if Jesus is God, <coughs> if Jesus is God, how does he have somebody greater than him? If if there is no if there is no God greater than God, greater than Jesus, if Jesus if Jesus is God, how how is the Father greater than him then? How, how do they like handle? How do they go about trying to argue that point? If it says right here that if Yahweh shot out of his own mouth said the Father is better than him, you can't go against that. That's his, that's his words. <coughs> that's a whole clip. 
letting you know how Christ he's, he's under God. There's more verses to prove that Christ is under God. I'm going to first uh, Corinthians chapter 15. Start verse 24. So uh, it reads, Then come up the end when he shall uh, have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he, he shall have put down all rule and all authority, for he must reign till he have put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, okay? For he put, uh, but he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, and which did put all things under him. Shalakia, this is the point. This is the point right here. Look. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So another question you can pose. Is there anybody that God is under? Is God under anybody? That's the question you can pose. Is God under anybody? And then they may say once again, they may say, they may say no. And you ask them again, is the is the son, is the is the is uh Christ under anybody? A Christian may they may say, Oh, you know, no, I mean no, he's not under anybody. Then you bring up this verse. <coughs> it says the son shall be subject. What does that word subject mean? Shall the son he shall be subject. To arrange under. Mm. To arrange under. Subordinate. He's subject. He's under Yahweh. But I thought that God is, is above all. If Jesus is God, he should be above all, right? There should be nobody, you know, over him, right? But that debunks that. Now, let me go to uh, John 8 real quick. John 8, verse 54. John 8, 54. It reads, Yahweh shall answer, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honor me, of whom you say that he is your God. That he is your God. So once again, Christ, Christ is speaking right here. And he said that the Father, He is your God. It didn't it didn't now in the Trinity. Now they say once again, the Trinity says, okay, you got uh it's three and one. You have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're all one, they're all the same, right? Then why did it say right here? Why did if if God is a is a third of the Trinity, why didn't it say that he is a third of your God? If the Trinity is, is real, it should have said that he is a third of your God. But it said that he is your God. It didn't say a third. It said he is your God. Not a third, not two thirds, not a fourth, not a half. He is your God. Full, only one God. So y'all got to deal with all these verses. Any, any Trinitarian would want to pose an argument about something, they got to deal with all these verses. This disproves the whole Trinity thing. How they continue to lie to us about things that, that is not real. Even though this topic may not be very may not be very salvific, but at the same time, though, it is very crucial to understand it because of the fact that some people, like I said, that they put Yahweh, I mean Yahweh Shai or, or you know uh Christ on the same level as God. Basically, like you know, putting a God before God. Or trying to put somebody on the same level like that that's kind of like your know, sin because the fact that you're trying to put somebody on the same level as god when you always say that there's no other god before him there's no god equal to him he's the only one only true god you know what i'm saying so a lot of people are in danger for believing in the trinity doctrine because of the fact that one is tied into christianity and that a lot of christians are tied into a lot a lot of other lives that i'm gonna get into you know with many other videos i make you know what i'm saying <coughs> Let me see. Uh, Slakia. Wait, Slakia, hold up. Y'all, Slakia, hold up real quick. 
I slocked y'all, slocked you. Um, had to pause the recording real quick. But, all right. Now, this verse right here, this verse is one of those daggers. One of those daggers that I use that can easily, you know what I'm saying, like stump out a Christian. I'm going to come down to trying to prove that the Trinity is not real. You know what I'm saying? The first matter of fact, I'm, I'm gonna get it in a, in a different version. For one, Matthew 20. Let me get it, let me let me get it in the uh, NIV. The NIV. Let me see what the NIV says about this verse, right? So, one thing I'll ask a Christian, right? I'll ask a Christian: Is God omniscient? Now, omnis omniscient means that God, he knows everything. God knows all. He, he has understanding of all. He knows everything, right? So it's God omniscient. Of course, the Christian will say, yes, he knows everything. He is God. Then you ask them, follow, follow up question once again, is Jesus omniscient? They'll say, yes, he is God. Okay, how about this? Matthew 24, <coughs> 36. Talking about the return of Yahweh, the return of Christ. It says, but about that day, this is the NIV, but about that flock, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only who? The father. The father is the only one that knows when the how when your house shots in the back. He's the only one that knows. NLT, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. ESV, concerning that it, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, Father only, nor the Son, but only the Father, nor the Son, except the Father. No man, what, what, what else? What, what are the versions? Nor the Son, but the, nor the Son, every version, almost every version is saying, the son doesn't even know when he's coming back, but the father. <clears throat> so if Jesus is God and he knows everything, why is he saying in this verse that he doesn't know when he's coming back? Why? Y'all have to explain all these verses to me. You can't skip over these verses. It clearly says that the son does not know when he's coming back. When he's coming back, only the father, only the father knows. Yeah, how the most I got. So that's that's another another cut. Another cut. And another cut. Now let's go to uh let's the let me go to Acts. Let me go to Acts. Hold up. Go back to Bible Hub real quick. Acts uh 23. Acts 3 and 13. Acts 3 and 13. Now I'm going to read it in the New King James Version. Let's see where is it at. Zoom in. So it says, The God of Abraham and Slakia, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. His servant. So, how can Yahweh be God if he's identified as a servant to God? He's identified as a servant to God. It's it's clear, clear as day. He's not called God in this in this past, in this verse right here. He's called a servant. So how can you sit here and say? <coughs> That Jesus is God, when it's clear as day that He's He's a servant. He's called a servant to God. Let me see what the uh like King James said. Have glorified his son, Jesus. He's called his son right here. So is, is the son the father? Is the son the father? That doesn't make any sense how the son could be the father. Like if if I'm if I have a child, that child is not me. That child is a is a, a version of me. 
another another little version a mini me maybe but it's it's not me though you know what i'm saying when it says that like when someone's called like a mini me or a son that's just you know the image you know you're steve that's that's the image of you you know what i'm saying the son is not the father the father's not the son they have very very distinct uh you know uh what you call it bros like i talked about how the father he provides the fact that y'all trying to take away you know yahweh's uh position by saying that jesus is god but the son does not provide the father does <clears throat> but let's go to uh some more verses real quick some more verses go to john sticks he makes a red letter john 6 and 37 so once again, how I talked about how the father is the one that gives, he he does he's not giving anything at all, and how Jesus he he can't be God if he's giving something by God, you know what I'm saying? But it says right here, all that the father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So the father is giving is giving Yahweh power of something. He's giving Yahweh something. He's all he's the he's the provider. Once again, the son is not the provider. The father is. <coughs> so that's that. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians uh, 4 and 30. Ephesians 4 and 30. It says right here, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are still unto the day of redemption. So, it didn't say right here, it didn't, it didn't say in this instance, to grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, it didn't say grieve God the Holy Spirit. It said the Holy Spirit of God. The fact that y'all sit here and say that the Holy Spirit is God, no. The Holy Spirit is a God, but it's not God. You know what I'm saying? And let, let me show, let me go ahead and get to that real quick. Hold up. Let me go ahead and get into that real quick. <coughs> um, in reference to the Holy Spirit not being God, right? Let me go to Acts 5, verse 1 through 4. So it says, But a certain uh but a certain man named Anani uh Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being previous to it, and brought brought a certain part and laid it at his at the apostles' feet. But Peter said Ananias, Ananias, why have stayed and filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? So once right here, the context is that Ananias, Ananias, he's lying to the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is, is you know, a part of the Trinity, right? So it says he's lying to the Holy Ghost. And to keep back part of the price of the land, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in, in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So he said once again in verse 3 how he lied to the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is called God. It's called God. <coughs> now, once, once again, let y'all know. The Holy Ghost is not God. The Holy Ghost is a God, but it's not the most high God. Once again, that's the same thing with Christ. He's called, he's called God. He's called a God, but he's not the most high God. Got to keep that in mind. So just because the Holy Spirit or the Holy Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're all in the same sentence or whatever other stuff, that, that does not make them all, you know, a part of a triune trinity. No. They're all gods, but there's only one most high, most high God. As I talked about in part one, how you got 1 Corinthians 5 and 8, where it said that there are many gods, but there's only one God. There are many lords, but there's only one lord. You know what I'm saying? Let me go back to my notes real quick and bring up some more verses. Uh, let's see. Let me go to Hebrews. This this is a huge cut. Let me go to Hebrews one. Hebrews one. Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 4. So it says, God, who at sundry times in uh, diverse manners 
spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made a world. So for one, once again, the Yahweh gave Yahweh Shah <coughs> the power to create all things for the world, you know what I'm saying? But who being in, in the brightness of his glory, in the expressed image of his person. So Yahweh Shah is the expressed image of Yahweh. Now let's see what, what express image is. Express image. It says the instrument used for engraving or carving, the mark stamp upon the instrument or raw out on it, a mark or figure burned in or stamped on an impression. So let me let me start something real quick. So y'all know what a brand is, right? I know what a brand is, right? Hold up. Uh, what what that what are things called? Um, sororities, or fraternities. Brands, right? Y'all see these brands? Let me zoom in. That don't look painful, but let, let me zoom zoom in though. Y'all see that brand, right? That's the brand. So, if Yahweh Shah is the express image, so this this right here, this brand, this is the ex express image, and it's left by what you have. You have a branding a branding like tool that you use to make that brand. So when you take that take that whatever uh whatever it is, whatever tool you use, you put it in heat or whatever you heat it up, and you put that brand against the person. To like mark it on their skin, right? So let me let me ask y'all this. What comes first? The branding tool or the brand left behind? You have to ask Christians these things so it can help help them understand how the once again the Trinity, the Trinity is false. So what comes first? The branding tool or what came first? What what is it what existed first? The branding tool or the brand I was left behind? And if they say something stupid, like the brand was that was in the high case, like no, because you use the tool to make the brand. So Yahweh is the branding tool. Yahweh Shai is the brand left behind. He's the express image of that branding tool. So that that's a huge cut on the Trinity. A huge cut. Because of the fact that it called Yahweh Shah the express image. He's the he's the brand left behind. That brand I was left behind from that branding tool, that's what Yahweh Shah is. It may look the same, it may it may have some of the same features, but it's, it's not the exact same thing because of the fact that they don't have some of the same uh powers. The brand does not have the power to, to brand anything else. The brand don't have the power to brand. The branding tool has the power to brand, but the brand the brand don't have the power to brand. That makes sense, because the brand was left behind by something. It was left behind by the branding tool. So that's that's a huge cut on the, a huge cut on the Trinity. A huge cut when you understand what what uh what you call it what a brand is, what the ex express image is. <coughs> now. Let's get into a, a few we are one statements or whatever that people may use. I'm going to John 17. John 17. And let's say verse 11. Uh, Salakia. John 17. I'm going to verse 21. All right. All right. So it's John 17, 21. It says that they may be slaughtered, that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So that they is referring to the Israelites when it says that they all may be one. So when it says one, it's not talking about, once again, 
how they're all connected into like just one God or one people. Like no, like in unison, they're on one accord. They're not all like, you know compacted into just one person. Like when it says that they may be one, so you're saying that they all merged together and just became one person? No, they all came together in unison in working on one accord. The same thing how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how they all came together in unison and they work on one accord. <clears throat> it's not saying that they are just, you know, one one human or one one God that's all compacted into like no. There's no three in one. There because they the the way that Christians talk, they want you, they they want you to believe that one plus one plus one equals one. That's how the Trinity is. They make you believe that one plus one plus one equals one, but that's not the case. One plus one plus one equals three, as we all should know. There are three gods, but one Most High God. Simple as that. It's not that hard. It says, in the glory which thou gavest me, I, ha I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. <clears throat> but even at the same time, too, if you want to sit here and have that Trinity argument, instead right here, instead that they also may be one in us. So when he says one in us, talking about the he's talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how the Israelites will be one in us as well. So there's no Trinity then. There's no Trinity, then it's because of the fact that you have the Israelites coming coming into them as well, making them a part of the whole, I guess, quad quadrinity. Have, have, whatever it's called, whatever you want to call it. So that, that whole statement is cut. It's cut. It's no longer it's no longer a trinity if we're a part of that one. If we're a part a part of, a part of them, that then there's no trinity then. And there are many other verses that that use that whole one oneness of thing. You know what I'm saying? Because look, let me show y'all. Where's that? Right here. Metaphorically, union and concord so you got john 10 and 30 john 11 52 like all those verses that you know they they all use the whole oneness thing showing you how like you know it's not talking about you know them being just a uh, one but them being as a union together unified just like how you know like you know when y'all all when somebody sings like they sing all 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 in like you know one one sound one voice one note they all sing as one because they gotta they gotta like do it together you know what i'm saying that's what it means by one so that's it for this video or that's it for this second part of the bunking the trinity or trinity debunked episode um i think the next episode the next episode may be the last Either it may be the last or second to last. I'm not going to make any promises, but it may be the last or second to last episode of Crying to, like, you know, this whole Trinity Trinity Doctrine thing, you know what I'm saying? Because I want to, like, you know, kind of get this get this out the way and kind of focus on, you know, other, other things as well when it comes down to, like, you know, end time prophecy and, you know, just uh, more things y'all need to do to get ready for what's to come, you know what I'm saying? But... I just wanted to get this out there to, in a sense, help y'all understand how, once again, the Trinity is not biblical, literally or figuratively. You know what I'm saying? It's not biblical at all. It's it's false. Y'all gotta get out of that Christian mind, that that Christian, you know, church or whatever. That a lot of y'all every every you know Sunday and everything take our money. Get out of it. You know what I'm saying? Get out of it. It's not gonna help y'all. But hopefully, in this video, in this uh, second episode of the, the Trinity debunk, y'all got edified, that y'all got informed on, you know, more precepts. Hopefully y'all took notes class, you know what I'm saying? Y'all took notes and understood, you know, what I talked about and everything. Hopefully it made sense. And that's all I got for y'all until the next part. But y'all stay prayed up, keep God's commandments, you know, stay faithful to him, stay in his word. Don't make any excuses for not being, being in his word, for not doing something that, you know, glorifies him. That worship him, worship, worship him and praise him. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you, you take out time every single day 
and give give that time to God every single day. Don't, don't care what you do, whether you're on whether you're on the toilet, the shower, give some time to God. You know what I'm saying? And also at the same time, keep his commandments to the best of his ability. Learn his commandments, learn his commandments and do them. But y'all know how the Bible says, be not only hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Doers of the word are just or not doers of the word, but doers of doers of the law are justified. I think that's in Romans. If I remember it's in Romans. But that's all I got for y'all. Love y'all. Peace and shalom.